Hey, this is uh, Zach Log the Great. I am here tonight with my friend Chris. Hey, Luke. And uh, we are joined tonight by Mark. Hi. And uh, t- we're getting together tonight to um, talk about G.K. Chesterton's poem, A Hymn for the Church Militant. Um, as usual, a uh, quick reminder, if you like my work, if you like what I do, um, please uh, support me uh, via subscribestar.com slash zacklog hyphen the hyphen great. And uh, having said that, Mark has volunteered to read the poem for us. So I'm going to put it up here on the screen. And there we go. Let me, let me know when that shows up. Looking good, Zach Locke. I'll begin. Okay. Go. A, a hymn for the church militant. Great God that bowest sky and star. Bow down our towering thoughts to thee, and grant us in a faltering war the firm feet of humility. Lord, we that snatch the swords of flame, Lord, we that cry about thy car, we too are weak with pride and shame, we too are as our foemen are. Yea, we are mad as they are mad, yea. We are blind as they are blind. Yea, we are very sick and sad who bring good news to all mankind. Thy dreadful joy thy son has sent is heavier than any care. We find, as Cain his punishment, our pardon more than we can bear. Lord, when we cry thee far and near, and thunder forth all lands unknown, the gospel unto every ear. Lord, let us not forget our own. Cleanse us from ire of creed or class, the anger of the idle tings. Sow in our souls like living grass, the laughter of all lowly things. Okay, and yeah, and I didn't know I hadn't read through that before. I did not notice. I'm pretty sure that one line is supposed to be the anger of the idle kings. Um, not your fault, though. <laughs> oh, <laughs> uh, thanks for correcting me. I I didn't know what to make of it. But okay, um, so uh, Chris, since uh, Mark read for us, would you like to um, start off with your uh, thoughts on this poem? Okay. Uh, well, first, overall, sometimes whenever we go over a poem, like, I think, okay, I need to say something about this. So I have to, like, look up, find some, like, analyses of it, you know, get other people's thoughts, sort of, kind of, you know, mull over that for a while. But with, like, Chesterton, like, something like this, like, first reading, it's like so much of it is just striking. And it just sparks so many different thoughts. Uh, like it just like the first one that really hit me is the firm feet of humility. Because whenever you think of somebody like standing firm, it's almost like sort of a sort of a prideful like posture or something. But when you think about it, like humility is like willing to change yourself like accept that you're wrong and change yourself for what the situation requires. So like, it's not just changing for anything, but it's like, Hey, something shifts. You don't just try to stand in the same way that's going to cause you to fall. So the sort of firm feet of humility, it presents an idea that I think is very powerful that I had never really framed that way before. Well, and the other thing with that is, um, since, like, if you're, um, if you're humble, you know, or at least for a Christian, it's because your, your trust is in something, you know, much bigger than you, something much, you know, more that, that there's something that matters a lot more than you. There is something that you must submit to. And as a Christian, if you do that, 
you can stand firm on him because you don't trust in yourself. And, you know, we shouldn't trust in ourselves, but if we, you know, lay ourselves humble before God, that's not, you know, that's not really the problem. That's not really, you know, the problem. Uh, uh, go ahead. I, uh, I took the poem after reflection to be an analysis of the rules of engagement for Christians. We are in a war, but we have a high standard. We are called to recognize our foemen as people in need of a rescue as much as a good thumb. And you know, Zach Log, I like bringing the thump down. I like winning. And I like demoralizing <laughs> my enemy. I mean, when I play StarCraft, I send the Zerglings, millions of them. I mean, I just want to win. But Christians have a nuance. We must have a higher standard. We're here to uplift. We're here to, to convert and to bring them aboard. I mean, heaven is real. We got to get these guys on board, even people we don't like. <laughs> and, uh, and so I saw him as putting his hand on my shoulder and advising me, don't go so gung-ho. Take, take time to think about why you're in this war. You know, it's funny, I watched you read this poem, I think it was 2017, there's a YouTube version of you reading the, the same poem, and you were very in touch with the emotional aspect of it. This time around, I thought I'd read it as good advice in a foxhole. <laughs> well, and, you know, you were saying, you know, we have to, we have to remember that we're, um, that, you know, these the the people who are arguing with are not really our enemy um and that you know ultimately we're trying to save them as well which you know that made me think of um ephesians six twelve. you know our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers against the authorities against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms um the people we the people we face face off against the the human beings that we, you know, find ourselves in opposition to, um, at no point are they the real enemy. Um, then there's, you know, and then there is the question of like, you know, to what degree are they willingly cooperating with the real enemy? And that's a real problem. I don't, I've, I don't know. I don't know about that, and I don't know, in some sense, how we're supposed to respond to that. But yeah, that is that is a thing. Well, and and also, like he says, uh, what is it? We too are weak with pride and shame. We too are as our foemen are. Yea, we are mad as they are mad. Like, you know, we're we're not out either. You know, we are we are just as susceptible to sin as any of them. As you know as they are, and, you know, if, if we do not repent, if we do not seek God's, you know, guidance, those can bring us down just as badly, if not worse. That's all true. In fact, I'm glad you met, you reference Ephesians. Uh, I don't know the, the passage, I don't know the chapter and verse, but something about seeing this world through a glass darkly, like, I think it speaks to me to say that I can barely make out what I'm supposed to do, but I know I'm your brother, and I will uphold you in arms. Let me see. Through a glass darkly. Where is that? It's Ephesians? First Corinthians. First Corinthians. Yeah. Oh, that was, that's from First Corinthians 13. That's you know, one, of the, one of those famous passages that gets read at weddings because people don't pay attention to the... Because <laughs> people don't pay attention to... Not enough people have read C.S. Lewis's The Four Loves. Um, is why that gets right at weddings. Um, but, um, Chris? But yeah, so with the, uh, you know, we are mad as they are mad, yea, we are blind as they are blind, sort of that idea of even though, like, these are our enemies in a sense, like, we're also sort of suffering from the same things they are. That uh, reminds me, the other day I heard a talk where someone was saying, uh, that God willingly underwent like three great humiliations. One was, you know, being born a human. One was, you know, being sacrificed on the cross. 
and one was entrusting the divine reputation to humans, like as the church, because as like there is no way we can accurately represent him to people on our own. So anything that we do through our own power, no matter how great our intentions, like we're going to fail. So it it's really up to us to do this very important mission. But on our own, like we cannot do it. We can never, you know, match Jesus. We can follow him as an, as an example. But we just have to be careful that we are at least still fighting on the right side because it's very easy to be it's very easy to call yourself a Christian and believe you're fighting for that cause when really you're just turning people away. I agree. I think it's very easy to say I'm a Christian and I'm going to use the worst nuke in my arsenal to show you. It's well, I... as you say, Zach, uh, Zach Locke, we, we are called to be, uh, we are called to be a higher sort of fighter. I think I think I was listening to what you were saying before. Uh, I can't remember the chapter in the verse when you quoted it. I wish I knew it like you do. <laughs> I mean, well, I'm beside myself. I, I well, I, I will say I I do know a few parts pretty well. Um, when I was in high school, I did um, like uh, I did uh, Bible quizzing, um, and so there are the parts that I did for that I actually know pretty well. But um, also, I just have Google open also. Um, oh. <laughs> so I, I'm just switching back and forth with that occasionally. Um, I know what to look for, like through a glass darkly. Like I knew that was, I, I knew that phrase or, you know, I knew, um, you know, we struggle not against flesh and blood. I knew that was something to look for, but you know, from there I'm just like, okay, where, where do I find this? So anyway, but go ahead. Or were, were you done? Oh yeah. <laughs> um, but the uh was uh you know one other um you know one other thing and you know, kind of like you said you know advice to um advice to uh christians in you know in, in this struggle you know the next next to last stanza um he says you know when we cry thee far and near and thunder through all lands unknown the gospel into every ear lord let us not forget our own. And, you know, it's going to sa- it's going to sound a little sarcastic or something. I don't mean it that way, but it's like Christians need Jesus too. <laughs> you know? That's you know, this, this is not um you know, it's not like we're you know, we're saying, "Hey, we we've got it. We've got it sorted out. We've got everything together." And that's why you should listen to us. It's like, you know, we're trying, you know, we're seeking his help. We are seeking his, you know, repair of this mess we've made out of ourselves. And, you know, you should, and, you know, you should come join us because he has the answers, not us. Well, I was thinking about cleanse us from ire. You know, someone like Owen Benjamin will tell you there's a kernel of ire in every routine. You want to be as haughty as possible when you bring the mocking uh, to, to a subject that really deserves it. But we, we're we supposed to be, for lack of even a, a better way to put it, classy. I would think someone like you, Zach Log, or the company you keep, or a gentleman's <laughs> company. I certainly not I, the scrappy ones I've seen on the internet. I don't know. I don't think uh, any. Uh, I uh, you know follow Vox Day's blog. I don't know if anyone's ever you know said you know particularly classy. Um, for uh, I think, I mean, if you you know, if you read the Gospels, you know, Jesus was not always uh, you know polite about things too. But it's and it's the thing. Um, you know, it, like like I the the thing from Ephesians. Uh, we have to keep in mind, you know, what we're fighting against. It's not the people. It's, you know, it's the ideas. It's the, you know, spiritual forces. And so, uh, you know, you can, it's, it's, I guess it's tough to do in the middle of, you know, an emotional, when things get emotional, um, 
because it's easy to you know go after the person instead of the idea instead of you know what they're saying it's easy to take it take it to the personal level um and it's also easy to score points that way there's um actually reminds me of a a poem by um c.s lewis um uh the apologist evening prayer and he talks about like you know those uh those quips at which well well um well angels weep the audience laughs and it's like you know this desire to you know score points and you know again at what cost so well, and i i think it's important to remember that whenever jesus was dealing with a lost person he was remarkably patient he was very easygoing the people that he sort of lost his temper with were the religious officials who knew better. Uh, he, he definitely took his audience and how much they could be responsible for what they know, like in, in mind. Like, uh, I, I go to John C. Wright's blog at Sci-Fi Wright, and I noticed that as an amateur theologian, there's a great humility when he approaches any of the things we're exposed to as Christians and how he would behave and I try to model myself after him. In fact, Zachlock, that's how I know about you. I found you on yes, his that's blog. Where, that's where we cross paths. Um, he's um, yeah, and it's um, and you know that's also something I think he tries to do. It's you know, it's the i, it's you know, pursuit of the truth, uh, and not, and not you know, individual uh. And not you know individual um, you know glory individual accomplishment, um, and so you know if which is you know like you know to you know go all the way back to the beginning, um, you know if you uh, if you put you know seeking the truth as your highest priority, you know that becomes a kind of humility because you you know your own you know your own fame your own. Uh, Bloody heck! I lost. I lost. Where I was. Your own fame, your own, you know, um, you know, personal achievement is not the point. It is, you know, this seeking of the truth, and you know, wherever that goes, is where you're going to follow it. Thank you very much for bringing this poem to my attention and Chesterton to my attention. You told me to read Heretics about a year ago. I began my. <laughs> I began my journey there. What a fabulous man. I can't believe that the things he says are so relevant. They sound like he's writing about today. Yeah, that is one of the amazing things about a lot of um, Chesterton's writing, um, like how very, how very applicable it is. Like, you know, it's all, it's about a hundred years later and, you know, it sounds, you know, very direct, very directly dealing with a lot of the things we're dealing with today. Um, and it's, um, and this is not just to you, this is to, um, you know, any, to, to the, to the audience as a whole. Um, one thing I've, I've honestly, my favorite thing, actually, now that I've found his poems, I, I, it may be in competition, but one of my favorite things at Chesterton's are just some of his collections of random essays like not the books, not the things he wrote as a book, but just um, you know, there are there are several books he wrote. Uh, there are several like there are several books of his that are collections of um, different things he wrote for the London Illustrated News or something like that. Um, the first, I I remember um, C.S. Lewis referred to him a few times, and then. Um, the first thing of his I picked up was uh, just a collection of one of those collections of essays, um, Tremendous Trifles. Um, and it's, um, it seems like he could take, like, he could take just any random thro- thought crossing his mind and, you know, put together a, you know, fascinating, uh, you know, two or three page essay, two, <laughs> three, five pages out of this. And that's, I mean, if I could do that, I would, 
I, I would uh, have I, I would have uh, have quite a bit more going than just my little YouTube channel. Um, <laughs> well, but, he's just so great about recognizing human nature for what it is, and not trying to fit it into some sort of preconceived framework. If he sees that humans are behaving in a way that's contradictory, he will embrace both sides of it. He won't try to explain away the contradiction. He'll revel in it. <laughs> and I think once you can see things for what they actually are, well, then you're going to have a lot to say about them. They, they cease to become a way for you to express your own ideas solely. You can actually talk about them in a way that might point to ideas you have but they can contain the truth for themselves for what it is. Yeah, and let's see. What was, uh, so, and this is you know, something I, we, I, we frequently end up saying in these talks. Back to the poem. Um, the, the, what is it? The one, two, three, the fourth stanza. Uh, the dreadful joy thy son has sent is heavier than any care. We find as Cain his punishment, our pardon more than we can bear. And, and uh, just that part, um, what is it? Just this idea that, like, you know, what got, you know, Jesus, what Jesus did for us as Christians um, and what, you know, we need to keep in mind, like, it's, there is a way that, you know, if, that that can be a burden, like, we're supposed to, we're supposed to live up to this and it's so frustrating because, you know, I, well, and it's like, uh, like Mark said, you know, we're, we're kind of the, the representatives or one of you said, you know, we're kind of the representatives of this. And, um, and it's like, you know, and, you know, we are the, we are the body of Christ. And it's like, wait, you're talking about me. I'm, I, I'm just an idiot. I, I, if you saw my day-to-day -day life, you would not be impressed. Um, and, you know, I'm, and I'm supposed to be the one carrying this, you know, and, yeah, and, you know, again, you know, we find as Cain his punishment, our pardon more than we can bear. Like, how, how could you do this for me? And what am I supposed to do with it now? Um, and it's, it is, you know, confusing and, you know, hard to hard to get a grasp on sometimes. Right, because if if you're if you're not a Christian, if you just see this as some story, then the idea of God, you know, becoming human and then sacrificing Himself on your behalf, that's just a story. Like that, it might be an interesting story, it might be a good story, but it's just a story. But when you accept that as the truth the weight of it just hits you and as great as it is as much as it is literally your salvation like you recognize can how completely unworthy you are and You're recognizing here, that is just a terrible thing to go through but it's also something that you have to go through in order to just recognize your role in life it's so true, Chris. I feel unworthy of the gift. I, I fall short, but I'm reminded that I'm not the only one. Well, and the, the other thing, um, which and you know, writers like G.K. Chesterton, like C.S. Lewis are you know, very good at this, is, you know, it's easy, at, it, it becomes easy, especially, you know, if you grew up, you know, you know, with a Christian family, if you grew up in the faith, it's easy just to, you know, kind of take it for granted, not to, not to think day to day, you know, what this means. Well, and honestly, kind of the way human beings are built, like we, we almost inevitably have to, um, I mean, you can't, it, it's like, um, it's like, you know, uh, you know, I get, I think all three of us here are married. Um, and like, I love my wife. Um, you know, we've been married for 10 years and 
but at the same time, it's the same kind of thing, you know, as when, you know, we first, as when we first met and when we first, you know, got together and just got married. Um, and it can't be because, like, there's life to deal with. <laughs> uh, and it's not bad. I mean, it's not less, but it's, you know, changed and it's, you know, kind of mixed in with all these other things. And finding, you know, there's, there's two things there. You know, one, you have to realize that it's not going to be, you know, if you're, if you're married, you have to realize you're not going to have that same emotional high, you know, more than the first year. Um, and if you expect that, that's a recipe for a, you know, a short marriage and an angry divorce. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but the other thing is, like, you have, you also have to, you know, find, I guess, at least moments of a way back to that. And it's, you know, kind of the same thing for the Christian faith. Um, you know, most, most of the time, you know, uh, you know, the phrase people sometimes use, mo- the phrase people sometimes use, like, you know, the mountaintop experience. And you have these moments where you know kind of this you know revelation or this you know great clarity of your faith but you know most most of the time you're not going to have that and you have to you have to carry on and you have to you know bring you have to learn to live you have to learn to live the faith quietly you have to le- learn to live you know without this big emotional high and you also have to find a way back to those. You have to find a way um, back to seeing it new again once in a while, which is something, you know, like I said, you know, C.S. Lewis, G.K. Chesterton are very good at, um, you know, showing you these things that you know, but showing them to you in a way that reminds you what it was at first. Um Someone? <laughs> oh, uh, I was going to add that the uh, faltering war. Um, <laughs> it seems, it seems we're not destined to uh, to triumph. Uh, I think it's going to be like in the end of the Lord of the Rings, where you have a circle surrounded by evil, and then a great triumph, not by us, but by by Christ. Uh, uh, when I was memorizing this poem, I was at Starbucks and I was going over the words. And I was looking through the drive through window at a couple of uh, Encino girls, and one of them just started giving me the finger. I guess she didn't like the fact that I was looking out the window at the words of the poem. I wasn't looking at her. But because I was in touch with, you know, the faltering war idea, I didn't let it get too much on me. And she got very confused as to why flipping me the bird wasn't working. And that's when I realized <laughs> I got something that she ain't got. <laughs> I got Chesterton, and I've got well, uh, I've got something to think about. You, you and you and uh, it's kind of funny to me that you connect uh, faltering war with um, you know Tolkien and the Lord of the Rings um, because you know that actually was um, you know a phrase Tolkien used. Um, he said, and I don't know the rest of the context of this, and I probably should, um, but he said, uh, you know, I've never seen history. As anything, you know, but a long one long defeat, um, and you know that it's not that you know there's going to be a lot of losses. There's going to be a lot of um, a lot of break, a, a lot of you know breakdowns, um, and like you know, if you look at you know the Lord of the Rings, um, and you know the the whole you know the whole you know Middle Earth. Um, it is kind of this long decline. Um, you know, the Silmarillion, you know, you had, you know, you know, all these characters running around that were, you know, effectively, you know, on a level with Sauron. That, um, you know, Feanor, you know, probably could have gone, pro- probably could have gone, you know, toe-to-toe with Sauron. It would have been a fair fight. Um, but then by the time you get to, you know, the events of the War of the Ring, like, you know, 
the the greatness that greatness has passed away. And then at the end of the Lord of the Rings, um, you know, the elves are leaving Middle Earth, and it's just it's just it's you know basically going to be left to the humans. And so, you know, there's there is this you know falling away. There is this sense of of uh, you know loss of greatness and. Uh, I I wish I could say otherwise, but I kind of um, I definitely kind of see that in you know contemporary events today. Um, no, I see it as well. You know, even the, even the three of us, uh, I see uh, Chris running the Skunks Works, and uh, I see you probably in the uh, the generals ranks, Zach Log, <laughs> and I see myself uh, sniper on the knoll. <laughs> we all have our place under Christ. And it is a faltering war, but what an end! We'll give them one hell of an end. Well, we we are in enemy territory, so it does make sense that we'd be surrounded. Yeah. Well, let's, let me see. Oh, what was uh It's also kind of funny, just the way this starts out. You know, great God that bowest sky and star, um, bow down our towering thoughts to thee. Like, you know, God, who the, um, the heavens bow down to, you know, you know bra- these prideful, these arrogant thoughts in us, um, you know, we have, we have these ideas of ourselves, these ideas of our, you know, of our greatness or our, the, or, you know, our correctness, uh, that's all, it's, um... That bow a sky and star, bow down our towering thoughts to thee. It's almost, it almost seems like a reference to the Tower of Babel. Um, because, you know, they thought they were going to, they're going to build a tower up to the heavens. And God had to say, you know, no, I'm sorry, this isn't, this isn't going to happen. And, you know, in our own minds, in our own arrogance, we want to do the same thing in our own ways. And, you know, he has to break us of that to, to um, you know, set us down on humility and give us that firm standing. I, uh, I agree. I, I was just going to say that the, uh, the Tower of Babel reference didn't escape me. I was thinking about that. Our towering thoughts today, we don't want to build another Babel. That didn't go well. Well, he, and that's... He does what? also contrast in the next, uh, the next verse, pride and shame together. Because, I mean, even if what we talked about earlier, where we realize how unworthy we are, if that feeling of being unworthy stops us from actually acting, then that's mm. just as bad as the pride is. Wow. I'll be spinning that one around. <laughs> Indeed, um, we don't want to be, uh, we don't want to be, in a, I don't even know what the word would be, uh, ashamed into an action or frightened into an action. Can you explain, Chris? Despair? Uh, oh, despair. Yeah. That, I think that covers it. Well, and yeah, that's, that's, you know, despair is, you know, a sin also. And that is, you know, something, uh, something to avoid. It's actually, um, it's kind of funny. I actually remember uh, there's, um, there's a blog I occasionally um, check in on uh, since I noticed uh, they posted they posted one of my videos, um, so I occasionally just see what's going on over there. And um, she recently um, put up about um, uh, a post about um, sloth, and you know, tr- and she said like you know, traditionally in church teaching, it's not about laziness, but it's about you know, disconnect from our spiritual duties, um, disconnect from you know what we ought. From the from the things we ought to be concerned with. So even if you're you know really busy and really energetic, um, if you're if you're directing all of this you know towards you know um, as as C.S. Lewis would say, if you're directing all this toward second things, um, ultimately that is still sloth. That and that is still um, you know a sin. And, you know, part of that is, you know, well, you know, I can't fix this part of myself. I, there's no way I can change this 
persistent flaw I have. So, you know, why bother trying is often where that goes. Go ahead. Uh, just thinking about, Lord, the, we that cry about thy car, uh, just as you mentioned sloth, I was thinking that that must refer to wrath. I suffer from that. Uh, you get so into your justification for taking it out on something, someone. We who cry about thy car, I think a car must be a chariot or something in, like yeah, that. That makes, sense. that makes sense in this context, yeah. Um, that, that's his, how I understood it. His, yeah, like his, uh, you know, a leader in his war chariot. Yeah, like, uh, like I was thinking of the 300 uh, when Xerxes rolls in on that thing that the slaves were carrying. That must be something like the, the, the Lord's car, like some insane adamantium hovercraft loaded with laser cannons. I mean, just something that nobody can possibly deal with. And we're like, yeah, we're coming with the hovercraft. There's nothing you can do. And, you know, we should, uh, we grab the sword of flame and we want to be on the side of righteousness, but we're not to punish. And I don't even know where the line is, Zach Love. And Chris, I'm sorry. I just don't know sometimes. It bothers me that I don't. I should be old enough to know. <laughs> Uh, so what was, um, I don't know. I think I've, I've covered most of the things I want to say about this one. Um, Chris, did you have, were there any other big points you wanted to hit? Uh, I'm scanning through it right now. Let's see. I think, I think that was most of it. We jumped around a little bit, but I think I, we hit everything I had noticed. Um, Mark, any last thoughts from you on this one? Thank you for letting me memorize the poem. And uh, <laughs> I appreciate what you've done for me today. Well, yeah. And um, to, one thing to the audience also, um, I, I, I am blessed with an excellent verbal memory. It's compared to a lot of people, it's relatively easy for me to memorize things like this, especially poems. Um, but even if it does take, uh, you know, more work for you, um, find a few poems, um, met, you know, pick, a, pick something you like, um, read through it a few times and try to memorize it. And it, if you, if you find something good, like by the time you've memorized it, you will see a lot more in that poem, um, than you saw there at the beginning and it kind of, it becomes a part of your mental landscape. Um, and it's, it, it's a really, um, it's a good practice to do occasionally. Um, well, uh, then I think we've uh, covered this pretty well. Um, thank you, uh, Mark, for joining us tonight. And I'll see. Uh, thank you. Uh, just thank you both. It was nice to meet you. Okay, and um, uh, God be with you.